um, he knows who he, uh, uh, he Kanakia Koto, uh, Tuia Kiranga, Tuia Kiraro, Tuia Tiko, Tuia Ki Roto, Tuia Ki Waho, Tuia Tato Te Tangata, uh, Kiti Kopapa Ute Hui Nei, Kiti Kopapa Ute Rangi Nei, Moriora Kia Tato Katoa. Uh, bind above, bind below, bind within, bind with beyond, bind us the people to the purpose of our meeting, to the purpose of this day and breathe life. And to all of us, thank you. Uh, housekeeping, uh, I'm just checking who's on Zoom. Um, no, I can't see that the councillors or board members there. Oh, oh, Barry is there. Councillor Dow is there. Uh, and just a reminder, a reminder for those on Zoom, um, uh, the meeting's being recorded and will be available on Council's YouTube channel. Please mute your microphones, otherwise Elaine will do it for you. For you. Um, toilets and fire exits. Toilets, Fuddy Putty's out through the door and to the left. Fire exit, shoot out there behind... Councillor Butler, um, the media are present. I can see Catherine's there and perhaps Max, I can't quite see. Um, and for those uh, that need some hearing assistance, there is hardware available in the public seating area. And this meeting is scheduled to finish at 11 a.m. Uh, apologies, uh, Mayor King for lateness. And apologies from councillors Greening and Maru. If someone's having to move the apologies, uh, councillor Alice and a seconder, please. Uh, councillor Charles Brass, with those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Uh, we have no speakers for public forum today. Are there any declarations of interest? No, uh, no late items. And we've got some minutes to confirm. And in terms of the minutes for the Environmental Regulatory Committee meeting on the 24th of April, I noted that there was a, at the end of the minutes where it uh, says what time the meeting finished, um, we didn't have the time in there. So that's added. Uh, but apart from that, is somebody... Uh, happy to move that they uh, are an accurate record. Councillor Mackenzie, thank you, and Councillor Kinnamont. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Uh, we've got the, the uh, minutes of the Animal Control Subcommittee open minutes for 24 April. If, uh, there's not, not so many people there to about a uh, move in second, so you were there. Uh, thank you. And you were there too. Thank you. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. And Animal Control Subcommittee confidential minutes, 24th of April. Move Councillor Mailing and second of Councillor Kinnamont. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. And finally, uh, 22 May, Dangerous Dams, Hearings and Deliberations Panel Minutes. Some people would have been there. You were there as well. There we go. Uh, and a seconder, please. Uh, Councillor McKenzie, uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Against, okay, carried. Very good. Uh, welcome, Gary and Ned. Please come up to the table. We've got a couple of presentations today on the status and prospects of the marine farming industry in Tasman Golden Bays. Very good to have you here. Thank you for coming in. And uh, Hemi Toya was also going to join you and us, and he's he's not available to do that today, I understand. So um, it might be that we do something a little later around um, providing the Moana Mara Moana perspective. Um, so I think your presentations, the two of them total about 20 minutes, 
and then we'll have time to um, just have some perhaps some questions or something, or maybe after each one, uh, or there might be some natural points through your presentation where there's a pause. A pause. But councillors, if you just let me know when you when you are thinking about something, and if we get a few people lined up, then we might have a pause anyway. The other one, alone. The other one. Okay. Over to you, Neve. Thank you. Uh, th th thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, kia ora tato. My name is Gary Hooper. I'm the Chief Executive of Aquaculture New Zealand. Uh, the presentation uh, I'm giving is sort of a, a, a light speed tour through the background of aquaculture uh, and, and its importance to New Zealand and, of course, to the region. So um, feel free to ask me questions as, as we go. I'm just going to pull your microphone a little closer to you. Thank you, Gary. Hopefully that's better. Uh, so aquaculture. So here we go. My here we here we go. Uh, some of you may remember this this character, a uh, popular TV show back in the seventies. Uh, certainly my favourite, Jacques Cousteau, and he said way back then we must turn to the sea with new understanding and new technology. We need to farm it as we farm the land. And around the same time, uh, aquaculture was making a uh, a pioneering start in in New Zealand. Um, across in Marlborough. Uh, that's a, a mussel farm. Um, just on aquaculture and, and seafood, generally, uh, aquaculture now surpasses wild capture in terms of supply of seafood. And it's an activity recognised by uh, imminent ENGOs around the world and many governments as a, uh, a very efficient way of producing a very nutritious protein. Uh, here in New Zealand, um, I'll talk a bit about the sustainability later. It's roughly 3,000 jobs, uh, and it's typically in regional New Zealand. Uh, our revenues, um, 760 million last year. Uh, prices, ex and much of it is exported, and those prices uh, remain pretty buoyant. And um, you know, un uh, underscore the, the confidence and uh, you know the future of the sector uh, in terms of its contribution to regional and national economy. Uh, whereas most of it, uh, top of the south dominates, um, probably 70% would occur in the top of the south between Marlborough and, and Tasman. Uh, other hotspots, um, Further Thames and, and Coromandel, uh, uh, Auckland, or also just north of Auckland and Northland for oysters. Uh, and um, so in Coromandel, it's uh, predominantly mussels. Uh, the Bay of Plenty is a, a sort of fledgling new area, Eastern Bay of Plenty. And uh, further south, um, Akaraw salmon has been a brand familiar to, to many of you. And uh, the hydro canals, you know, Mackenzie Country hydro canals, some freshwater salmon in there. And way down in the south, and it's actually crossing Rakiura, uh, mussels and salmon. But as I say, the uh, TTE who dominates the production was 70%, uh, uh, roughly half the salmon, and the rest of it, a mussel or a hat and a handful of oysters. Uh, talking about regional New Zealand, um, you know, the people who work in the sector, you know, they 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 have families, they have uh, children attending schools, schools, and in many cases, the, uh, the sector, you know, supports a lot of the um, you know, community activities, whether it's the voluntary staff or the sports clubs, uh, events, uh, etc. Um, we're also involved in, in uh, various conservation, whether it's restoration activities or support for cons conservation, you know, uh, pest-free beach cleanups. There's a lot of uh, environmental work that occurs as well. Uh, mussel, I'll just point out mussels. Um, these are unique to New Zealand. The green shell mussels are native of New Zealand. Nowhere else on the planet uh, uh, grows the these type, this type of mussels, and they are New Zealand's only indigenous protein that we farm. And here's a video just to show you if you have I'm not sure how familiar you are with mussel farming, but uh, what, what does under the water look like? It's 
So those drop, what we call droppers, uh, they're just loops of line that the muscles are attached to. And uh, I, I, you saw on that earlier slide, there was a, a line of floats on the surface. That's what we call the backbone. And those lines that the diver was swimming through, they just loop down and it's a continuous line. So when they're seeding out, setting it up or harvesting, it's like a continuous line that they bring up onto the barge to, to harvest. Um, the ecological effects of mussel farming, shellfish farming in particular, are well known and, and recognised here in New Zealand and around the world um, uh, to either be uh, neutral to positive in terms of the effects. And we see here in Tasman Bay and across in Golden Bay the um, uh, ecological improvements that uh, mussel farming has, has actually uh, facilitated. Um, both areas, of course, extensively, say, scalloped, uh, and uh, that has had an effect on the, uh, the sea floor. Uh, the mussel farms themselves have kind of created a, uh, a protection area. Uh, so the oh, obviously there's no scalloping at the moment, but you, you cannot access under it because of the, uh, the loop lines. And uh, 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 reports are that they're actually have the scallops uh, doing okay under the mussel farms. So that's one of the ecological uh, positives of it. Uh, mussels in particular, that's our, our biggest export, in fact, New Zealand's largest seafood export are our humble mussels, uh, export to 77 countries. Uh, that was me at a, a trade show, it was actually uh, in Chicago, uh, attended by 70,000 people. And I remember uh, uh, the woman in the salmon-coloured jersey saying, uh, Mary Joel, Mary Joel, come over, come over and taste these, these are the best oysters I've ever had. <laughs> But anyway, loved our mussels, uh, and uh, of course they're all over the all over the place. Uh, another story in China. Uh, we uh, helped pull together a, a collaboration of companies, uh, created a brand pure New Zealand uh, green shell mussels. Uh, we introduced that in 2012, and you can see the growth that that created uh, in in uh, that particular market. Um, the dip dip in 2022. That's COVID. Uh, they had quite austere, uh, um, severe and uh, uh, measures, and, and the economy there has still sort of struggled to uh, reignite. Uh, so it's still lagging in that market. Um, but the Chinese Premier, that's the two I see, he's in New Zealand next week, and there's a, sp a specific interest around aquaculture. So hopefully we can uh, restock that fire. A supremely green. Um, I, I talked about the ecological effects, um, but uh, as importantly, around the world, and these are very credible organisations, WWF, uh, Nature Conservancy, uh, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, in the US, which is our largest export market for both mussels and salmon. Uh, they rate New Zealand salmon and our, and our mussels and our oysters in their best choice category. We're the only country on the, in the on the planet that has that for our salmon, and uh, uh, when we when we secured another backstory there at a, a culinary uh, uh, symposium over there that is called the CIA, not the not that CIA, the Culinary Institute of uh, North America, and uh, there was a guy there. He ran a, 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 a large business doing sort of premium uh, catering for Google and a lot of Silicon Valley. And he said he'd never, never serve farm salmon. I said, oh, well, I, you know, in this big symposium, I, I called him out and asked him why that was, and he had a, a range of perceptions. But at the end, he said, unless Monterey Bay support it, we won't touch it. Now, that was in Napa. Um, that's only a couple of hours north of Monterey Bay. Next day, I went down to Monterey Bay and started the engagement. They did a full assessment. Uh, they're actually doing a review at the moment as, as well. But we've had uh, uh, three assessments from Monterey Bay, always received the best choice. And um, this is what happened to that market uh, after receiving that Monterey Bay endorsement. Uh, USA is by far our most popular market. Um, we can't grow enough to supply it. Uh, uh, but uh, that's the difference that a environmental endorsement, sustainability endorsement will provide in market. Uh, just lastly, on the environmental side, uh, everyone talks about the environmental uh, footprint. Um, we did a, and the settlement, not, not we, uh, we engaged a, uh, an organisation to do an assessment of it. 
uh, you can see uh, king salmon oysters mussels um, really low uh, carbon footprints compared with other forms of protein and uh, New Zealand typically when you look at beef and lamb uh, etc New Zealand pitches at the shallowest end of those measures where the dark blue lines are the global average but uh, you look at mussels we have a lower environmental footprint or, or carbon uh, uh, footprint than tofu uh, of course our products taste a hell of a lot better than tofu but personal view uh, uh, really you, know, you recognize the sustainable uh, I mean you think of a low emissions economy um, high quality protein at very low emissions uh, agriculture strategy and um, uh, that's government strategy and, and we've had successive governments and I go back 20 years from Helen Clark's government and then the John Key government and then the, the coalition flavors subsequently they've all been fans of aquaculture have always struggled with the uh, regulatory framework to, to enable it and uh, uh, a lot of effort's been put into just maintaining what we have it here yet we still have you know uh, headwinds there and I'll, I'll come to that in a moment um, but successive governments have recognized it as have the environmental groups uh, but it's you know how, how, do, how do we do that the second uh, piece there that's a, uh, a sector business plan accelerating aquaculture and uh, uh, that just talks of the, the, the work programs but also reflects uh, some of the things that the uh, current government uh, are pursuing um, so in terms of national direction, these are these are high profile uh, pieces of legislation. Uh, fast track approvals bill that's you know been in the house for uh, over a month now and um, attracting a, a, a fair bit of attention. And, and bear in mind, New Zealand's has in legislation a fast track uh, process, uh, uh, but this bill you know has you know, a slightly different way it's approaching it, but. The environmental protections are still there. The, the treaty obligations are still there. Uh, it seems like it's also been a, a lightning rod, rod for whether it's, we call it political or ideological, uh, uh, you know, leaning back into the government, but uh, all of those things. That will get teased out through the you know, public submission processes, which are currently underway. And... Uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if elements of that will, will possibly temper uh, elements of the bill, but it is about uh, how do you how do you you know uh, stimulate the economy yet preserve the environment, uh, support uh, regional economies, support regional environments uh, uh, at, at the same time. So it's not as as binary as uh, um, the media or media some groups would uh, uh, happily present it. Um, the second piece of national direction resource management uh, um, amendment bill and that's to do with the extension of coastal permits for marine farms uh, that was introduced um, introduced to the house on uh, on the 30th but uh, the debate it was first read and debated on Saturday night uh, that that recognizes that look as a sector we spend an awful lot of time, uh, just securing what we have and in, in some cases it's just relatively straightforward but in other cases it can get litigious and, and escalate through the courts and uh, the amount of uh, uh, cost and resource and <laughs> I'm not sure if distraction is the right word but it does consume a lot of resources you get there in the end but you've spent uh, uh, all that time and effort uh, often on the, the bureaucracy of it as opposed to you think putting that energy into your productivity, your innovation, uh, uh, your growth, you know, trying to get more from what what we you know, is essentially coming out of the uh, um, out of the commons, and the government have recognised that, and that's the the main reason for that uh, bill. But I think of other uh, aspects. Uh, I'm not looking to, to blame a council, uh, a council, but an example is Marlborough, their regional plan started in 2006 that that process has still not delivered an operative plan so that's how long these some of these processes go yet we, we know that you know climatic conditions change you know whether they're oscillating la nina on uh, uh, nino la nina or whether it's uh, uh, other trajectorial changes you know say some say, say the water's getting warmer etc 
and yet you've got a plan process that's taking over 20 years. We're still a wee way away from concluding that, and uh, uh, yet we're hamstrung around what we can do in terms of innovation, uh, adaptability, et cetera. Um, biosecurity, and Ned's going to talk to specific biosecurity, but I'll just make the comment that um, biosecurity in the marine space, no one is more advanced than the aquaculture industry, all off our own bat. Uh, uh, we've developed standards, we've got farm management templates, we have protocols, we work closely with councils, and, and I rate the top of the South biosecurity network, so that's the councils and MPI uh, and, and uh, industry and, and, and a few other users sort of um, intimately get involved. But that is the best example of council uh, marine bi biosecurity uh, uh, in practice. And we've often said to other, other areas, hey, look what they're doing on the top of the south. Uh, 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 they're by far the best organised. But, um, uh, and I say, yeah, we'll talk to a specific biosecurity uh, uh, incursion across in Port Tatakoe. Uh, talk about farming. That guy there, he's, he's concerned about the state of his grass. Uh, this, think of the water, it's exactly the same. Nutrients vary in the water. And uh, uh, we need the ability to, you know, to adapt our farming practices around that. Innovation, uh, this is oyster farming, uh, uh, changing the way oysters, oyster farming is occurring. Um, it's now a very successful export product that developed uh, just up in Crisales. And last, is it just a video to give you a sense of the, the, the sector. It's a really short video. That's it. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Gary. Any questions or comments? Uh, perhaps not monologues, but um, anything you'd like to um, ask? Start with Councillor Kinnamons. Thank you for the presentation. Brilliant. And including the last little video at the end there. You've started to move some of the mussel farms away from the land a wee bit, getting out into the moving water a bit more. That's that's a big leap, isn't it? It's, um, can you just give us a bit of a heads up on why you're doing it and the progress so far? Yeah, there's, there's probably two initiatives un underway uh, in, across the Mulroot part of the um, proposed plan, environment plan discussions is a shift, shift further up. That's a 50-metre uh, movement. And the, the principal reason there is it's recognised that the closer in shore has the uh, higher value ecology. So it's actually moving away from that higher value ec ecology. And bear in mind, many of those farms have been in situ for 40, you know, at least 30 or 40 years. Uh, so, so that's one. And the other is also recognition that the sheltered inshore waters, they're also, you know, they're highly, I'd say not contested, but uh, are utilised by a, for a range of, uh, by a range of users and, and, and in terms of uses. And uh, in terms of future growth, it is moving to further offshore. So that's, it's a, we're probably, uh, uh, you know, the, the opportunities for sheltered inshore waters is limited versus the opportunity, you know, when we occupy fractions of a percent of our EZ. And uh, with that, of course, that fuels innovation and uh, um, adaptability to different conditions. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mayling and Councillor Shulcris. 
Yeah, love mussel farms, great places to catch snapper, that's for sure. Um, I understand that there's a move to go ocean farming um, for salmon, and, and there's been, I've read some stuff about it, and I think they've got the consenting now. Um, and that's going to be up near Cook Strait or on the edge of Cook Strait. Is that correct? Yep. So the local company, uh, New Zealand King Salmon, have uh, been granted a consent. The project is called Blue Endeavour. Uh, it's six k's off the point of uh, uh, Cape Lambert. Um, so you think of the western side of Port Gore and straight out uh, out there. As I say, it's Cook Strait. Um, particular area is starting to open up. So a lot of, we think Cook Strait, you think of that rough bit of water, turbulent bit of water, uh, but it's more to the west of that and uh, things, uh, wave uh, conditions, etc. to settle down there. Uh, so that's one project. There's also uh, other pro projects uh, being proposed in Southland. Uh, Naitahu uh, have ambitions there and, and another company that... Um, uh, Sanford was the company looking down there, and uh, salmon farming. Look, that that in terms of its uh, uh, potential for New Zealand, we talk about the government strategy has a goal three billion. It's most of the heavy lifting, but it is the space it occupies is absolutely tiny. So that's that's the ambition there, and in those more I say energized environments, the uh, uh, the the Ecological effects are minimised as well, so that's that's probably a good thing too. What well, is a good thing? Thank you, Councillor Shellcress. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Um, my brother's actually in the industry, or well, has been in the industry for a few years. Um, just two questions. They probably turn into one, but I have heard that there's a, a real issue with the spat and the amount of spat. And what would be your biggest concern in the industry at the moment with you know moving forward? So uh, thank you. Uh, so spats are baby mussels, uh, uh, microscopic. Uh, uh, you, you think of the animal that, that produces millions of these uh, babies to probably, hopefully, uh, uh, maintain its population. So it is a what, what we uh, describe as a, a broadcast spawner. The, the spat, so our industry relies on this uh, wild spat that attaches itself to seaweed and, and these are from uh, shellfish beds off the coast of um, the far north, Ahipara, if you know the area, at the bottom of um, Te Onorotui, 90 mile beach. And it, uh, the, 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 these microscopic uh, uh, larvae attach itself to, it's not big kelp or anything, it's just loose seaweed rolling along the seafloor. And if some of that, some of that seaweed washes up on 90 mile beach, there are a small number of businesses that collect it up and put it on trailers and trucks, and 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 that's distributed to farms right around the country. That's probably seventy percent of the industry relies on that natural phenomenon. Uh, last year, uh, the conditions there were were unfavourable for collecting that spat. It just wasn't washing up. So, as an industry, we received uh, roughly half of what we'd normally expect from that. So that's uh, put a wee bit of pressure on uh, um, you know some of the farming practices, but. At the same time, we're looking at other uh, wild catch spat catching sites, and I think a Wainui is a critical one for that. The, the farm in Wainui, for, where they just put lines in the water, and the, again the larvae settle on that. So that's an, a, a critical resource. Uh, we also have a, uh, a nur well, sorry, a hatchery out at the Glen. Um, uh, called, uh, the company's called Spat NZ on the, the Cawthron site there. Uh, and there's an iwi in the Eastern Bay of Plenty in the process of building another hatchery. So it, it is a, a combination of, you know, uh, making the most of those natural sources, but also looking at well, what mitigations can you have. And, and on the farming side, there's a lot of research looking at, to, like, if this, this precious material, how do we best utilise it to uh, uh, optimise the productivity from it? Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick one for me. In terms of um, concerns expressed by communities that uh, we, you know where the farms are sort of um, situated, are there are there what, what's the level of any concern that's expressed to the industry from communities? Yeah, probably uh, the one that 
the, the industry really, you know, really needs to stay focused on is, you know, you're farming out in rough water, the, the or so can be turbulent water, uh, occasionally floats or, or material from a farm will break loose and it'll turn up, it'll uh, eventually find its way onto the beach. And so first and foremost, it's coming up with ways of how do you absolutely minimise any material uh, uh, being lost uh, into the environment. And uh, if it is being vigilant about you know, having programs about, well, okay, uh, uh, make sure that there are regular beach cleanups, et cetera. Uh, so so that, that, that is the, probably the, the principal one. But you also get, you know, if you, if you, I don't know, if you go on YouTube or if you do some sort of media search, there'll be a very small percentage of energized people and they've all got their genders and I'm sure in their minds, you know, that is their flavor of virtue. Uh, but they will dominate the amount of material, but they are a very uh, small small group. And as an industry, you know, I think I reflect back on that, you know, we're, we're proud that we actually engage with these people. We maintain engagement. Uh, we often invite them to our, our conference, you know, as a, a complimentary uh, uh, arrangement. And in many cases, they turn up, which I think is wonderful. We'd rather have the engagement and work through the issues than... Uh, uh, you know, ignore their concerns. In, in some cases, though, you know, they'll be making claims that aren't, you know, uh, well founded and uh, uh, less inclined to, you know, uh, want to work with you on those things. It's just where their views are. Thank you. And would you say that there's been improvement in terms of the material that's getting loose and washing in? Like, has there been improvement? around what's being used and how it's used. And it's my understanding that there has been, but does that... In, in, in short, yes, but uh, probably that's a, a timely segue to Ned, who's been at the forefront of some of these yeah. uh, initiatives. So. Yeah, yeah. Sure. so I'll, I'll answer that first. So, so in short, yes, and that's coming in a number of different ways. So we're getting better at, at um, targeting our beach cleaning effort. So because we've been collecting data for so long, we now know where the, the hot spots are, where the currents and winds converge. So we know where to, we need to focus our cleanup effort. We're also developing different technology. So what's being used in Golden Bay now in terms of floats is very different to mm. you know the, the previous few decades. So there's predominantly uh, mechanical attachment floats being used as opposed to a lashing. So what that means is that think of a, a rubber grommet going around the backbone and then there's either a peg or a couple of bolts that are actually securing the float to the to the backbone. So what that does is it, it just means that our float loss problem is is greatly improved. Yeah. And that's right. um just about all of the companies farming in, in Golden Bay now are using those type of attachments for their inflows, which is where the majority of the energy goes. If you, you imagine a wave coming down, mm. it's kind of like down the train tracks and it all stops at one end. And that's what gets your your inflows loose. So yeah. The other things we're doing is, um, well, we run a, a big crew education program. So MFA employs a, a mentor that all he does is goes around the vessels and talks to the crews about how important environmental performance is and talks them through all of the MFA codes of practice and that type of thing. And he also helps them get on the beach so that they can see the impacts of not performing well when they're actually picking up waste that's come off a, a vessel. So, right. Thanks, Ned. One more, yeah, yeah, yeah. bioplastic ties. So we're, we're working on bioplastic ropes. So they are they're, um, a product that's marine degradable, entirely organic. Mm. So that's a really interesting line of inquiry. So that's a, it's a complicated process because it's biodegradable that breaks down and you want it to break down. You just want it to break down at the right rate Better. that it yeah. still does its job. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a number of trials going in that space at the moment. Right. So plenty happening. Yeah, good night. A council about this got a... Um, a question, and then we'll move to your presentation there. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about um, electric muscle boats as to whether or not we're seeing a development, because one of the issues for communities, um, as Ned will know, is um, the noise of muscle boats. And I know that I know that they do a lot of work to try and reduce vibration and that type of thing. But I'm just wondering whether or not electric boats are an option, whether or not they, if they are, whether or not they are actually being used or what's the future for electric muscle boats? 
I'm not, I'm not aware of any uh, vessels currently, you know, relying on electric. I, you, you're absolutely right. A lot of work's gone into, uh, like the exhaust systems, etc., and uh, protocols for operations that they don't get out there and you know, five a.m. and turn the radio up while they're getting ready to head head on out. So it bounces off the water. Uh, it, it, industry will, you know, really keep a uh, a track on you know, viable options for um, mitigating noise, whether that's in the propulsion systems or uh, in the silencing of those things. But um, I'm not aware of any, you know, um, commissioned vessels, new barges that are exclusively electric. Do you, do you think it's a possible option or is it just a not, not a viable thing? I think it's possible, but the problem is that those boats are doing long days. So they're not a ferry that's going from charging station A to charging station B. They're, they're spending 12, 16 hours in a, on a single trip and and finding battery power to, to run that plus the gear is the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a few people bring it up with me and um, it would be good just to know whether or not it is actually something that could happen or whether it's not. And well, from what you're saying, it's just something that's not really suitable. It might, yeah, it might be that. Or whether or not there's a hybrid. Thing, yeah, yeah, but... some sort of hybrid, because it, if it only has to be quiet for that first, you know, 30 minutes or so. And so, the, you know, no, no doubt there are, you know, uh, uh, technologies emerging that could possibly look at that. It's, it's something industry is, is aware of and, uh, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue to examine the, yeah, it's uh, the options there. Thank you. I think I think okay. I think some protocols too, isn't there? When the boats are leaving port, that they're going as a certain slow speed and cranking up a bit further out as the stereo cranks up, probably about the same time. Um, over to you, Ned, for your presentation. Thank you. Sure, thank you. So, just a quick introduction. So, Gary runs the AQNZ, which is the the big body, the national body. MFA is a is a regional body. So we're, we're sort of doing complementary work, but MFA is focused solely on the top of the south. Um, yeah, we represent salmon oyster and mussel growers, and we're also, also a water space owner. So we're self-funding by leasing water space that we own back to the industry. That's how we generate our revenue. Um, five key focus areas there. I won't go into those because we are taking up lots of time. So just a bit of an update on what's happening in the Tasman region in regards to mussel production. So development is, is ongoing in Golden Bay. We've got a laser here. Yes. So in terms of development, uh, AMA1, which is up off Collingwood here, that's now about 80% developed. So the uh, C and D blocks, which are those outer blocks, are fully developed, and there's still a little bit more to go in B. Uh, coming down here to AMA2, so this is the L to O group. They're currently at about 25% developed or a little bit more. And they've got stage development requirements. So they're at a point now where there's enough data for them to, to move to the next stage. So they'll be able to be developed in the next few years. And P and Q block here, which is the one of the original uh, ring road farming sites, that, that's fully developed as well. So there's some numbers down the bottom there that provide a uh, indication of development so that's 2023 so we're probably a little bit more advanced than that now uh, for, for Golden Bay. What's been happening in Golden Bay so Gary's talked about uh, how short of spat we were this year luckily everything we put into Golden Bay has absolutely thrived it is looking really really good and that's um, going to go a long way to getting the industry through a really tough patch so Golden Bay is an incredibly productive space for mussels they grow extremely well there. So the industry is very thankful for that. Um, there is changes between, you know, with Urenzo, Southern Oscillation, and El Nino is definitely the most productive. And it's not just in Golden Bay, that's right across the top of the south, generally. Uh, in terms of harvests, we're expecting a pretty significant volume to come out later this year. So there was a whole lot of seeding done uh, 12 to 18 months ago, and that'll flow through into to harvests. Uh, this coming harvest season, which is November through to June. And for the year to date, so that's 11 months, there's been 9,500 tonne of mussels go across Port Tarakaui. 
And for FY22, 23, the, the total was 11,300. Now there's also a little bit of leakage to Port Nelson. So some of the companies will land their product there. Not not a whole lot, but the number is a, a bit bigger than that. So I'd expect volumes to probably be pretty similar to the previous year based on the fact that some of the companies are still flat out harvesting in Golden Bay at the moment. Tasman Bay, that's a slightly different story. So Tasman Bay is a lot rougher and a lot, well, not a lot less productive, but it is less productive than Golden Bay. So most of the companies are, are focusing their effort on Golden Bay at the moment. Uh, we'll, we expect to see Tasman Bay developed, but not as not until Golden Bay has been through the process and as, as Golden Bay will be filled up first, effectively. Um, so there are companies still farming Tasman Bay, but because of those challenges, there's less effort going in there. Now, we talked a little bit about noise. Uh, thanks to TDC for getting a, a noise assessment funded. And you've prob possibly received this report through one of the committees, but I'll just highlight some of the key points. So there is a, a small group in Golden Bay that uh, complained to, to MFA and to council weekly about noise. And this assessment will hopefully go a long way to giving council confidence to uh, respond to those complaints. In short, there are no noise limits for vessels moving, um, but for that, the purposes of that assessment, they used a, a nighttime limit of 40 decibels. All of the vessel movements were below that threshold. All of the vessels that were observed were complying with the code of practice, and the marshal day didn't observe any unnecessary noise. And that, that's their conclusion there. So point three is probably the critical one. Overall, we consider that noise from marine farming operations is reasonable based on our survey results. The controls in the MFA code of practice are adequate to address the residual effects. So that's, that's pretty positive from our perspective. I've just included one of the, the graphs from the report there, and that shows low frequency vessel noise, crickets, cars, and cicadas. And I'd just like to point out that cicadas are breaching all noise standards, including heavy industrial, and should be heavily regulated. Just to say they are a shrimp, aren't they? I heard on the RNZ the other day, actually. Yep. And people eat them and they taste a bit like a shrimp too. There you go. Eat more cicadas. So just moving on to environmental monitoring. So Nick, can I just check? So did you say that there was funding available, made available from council for that noise assessment? Yeah, that was TDC commissioned that assessment. Yeah. So if that report hasn't been tabled, it will no doubt be tabled soon. Yeah. So on to environmental monitoring. So all of the consents in Tasman have got environmental monitoring requirements. Uh, they're primarily addressed at, aimed at three things. So there's, there's benthic impacts, so impacts on the seafloor, there's water column impacts, so that's self-explanatory. And some of the more recent consents have got marine mammal monitoring requirements. So just a, a quick indication of uh, the types of things that are being found out there. So in AMA2, there was a, and Cawthron's done all of this reporting work, in AMA2, the seabed monitoring showed that there were actually indicators of improved ecosystem health beneath the mussel farms when compared to the control sites. And there's a, a bit of detail around epifaunal and informal adversity there. For AMA2 as well, so that's in Golden Bay, the water column monitoring showed that there was actually increased chlorophyll A concentrations inside the farm as opposed to outside at the control site. So chlorophyll A is a, a proxy for phytoplankton depletion. Uh, phytoplankton. And what they're trying to find is depletion within the farms, but there was actually more of it. And similarly, for AMA3, which is in Tasman Bay, same result, higher chlorophyll A concentration, concentrations within the farm as opposed to the reference site. So basically, the industry is spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to monitor the fact that the benthic habitat is improving and that there is no impact in the water column. So personal opinion, I think that that monitoring's a little bit silly and that we should be looking to, to dial that back. So we can have that conversation in the future. Uh, this one's a, a little bit more on ecosystem services. So we've already had a comment around the snapper and you, you might've caught this on the news recently, but research out of the University of Auckland has found that snapper that are living within mussel farms are actually healthier from a nutritional standpoint than those that are living outside the farms. And 
the nutritional condition was the same as as in pristine reef ecosystems, which in uh, in the modern world it's very difficult to find a pristine ecosystem. So, yeah, those those species with those animals within the farms were much healthier. And I I think you'd find the same thing in Golden and Tasman Bay, and that's a piece of work that we we might look to to progress. Beach cleaning. So every year the industry puts a lot of effort into beach cleaning and right across the top of the south we spend an average of 2,000 hours per year. Um, for 2023, so that's calendar year 2023, we collected 4,939 kilos of debris with 26% of that attributable to aquaculture. For Golden Bay, we picked up 50 kilos of aquaculture debris and 135 kilos of other. In Tasman Bay, we picked up 160 kilos of aquaculture debris and 2,495 kgs of other debris. So that, that's just a point of interest that in Tasman Bay, there is a, a lot more other rubbish than, than anywhere else that we that we undertake beach cleans. And that's likely a, a function of population, but it's quite, quite striking. Um, just to note that when we say aquaculture debris, we don't count floats. So floats are heavy and we reuse them. So that's not included in that debris number. Uh, and just a, a note there that for the onboarder services contracts for all of the farms in the Tasman region, it's actually a contract requirement for that provider to do beach cleans on top of all of the, the voluntary stuff that the industry is doing. So there is plenty of effort going on in that space. And that shot there is just a, an image of a clean out on farewell spit that we, we did a couple of years ago. And just draw your attention to the fact that there's actually a a fridge that we picked up along with several mattresses, about 400 jandals, 300 shampoo bottles, a number of tires and a lot of posts. So there's all sorts of things to be found out there. <laughs> uh, just just a note on, on muscle restoration. So we've been working in the space since 2019 uh, and I won't go too much into the previous research. I've just flagged the fact that we're extending what we did in the Polaris to Golden Bay and Delaware Bay, uh, and that project's underway at the moment. So we're hoping that in July, we'll actually be deploying shell and mussels into three or four different locations within Golden Bay, and then monitoring how uh, survival and what happens to um, species abundance and diversity on those, those plots. So that's going to be a really interesting piece of work. And the study in the sounds found that there were four times more blue pod, 66 more times more triple fin, a whole lot more sea cucumbers and a whole lot more microalgae, uh, macroalgae, sorry, on the, the restored mussel beds. And we know from, you know, significant flood events and other things that light sediments, fine sediments are a real issue in the bays. And by putting some shell down and putting mussels on top of them, that's one way to address some of the decline that's occurred. I'm going to check with you, Ned, how many more slides you've got. Uh, not too many, actually. Okay, we might just need to I'll fly through them. skim through these yeah. ones. Yeah, thank you. So we, we've talked about stat shortages and so a site that is absolutely... I've got a bit of feedback here. Mm -hmm. A site that's absolutely critical to the industry is, is Wainui. So there's uh, eight, eight blocks there. It only shows up as six, but there's eight blocks taking up 16 hectares. And that one site in a good year can supply 30, 40, 50% of the industry's spat needs. And luckily this autumn, uh, one of the companies caught the equivalent of $6 million worth of mussels. Um, so pretty big numbers. So when one of we works, it's very, very important. And I'm just flagging with you now that the, there will be an application lodged this month with council uh, to renew those consents. And we may get some help from the uh, the national direction that, that Gary mentioned, but the pathway as it stands through the, the operative plan to reconsent one early is very complicated and it may not have worked. Anyway, as I'm in a rush, we won't dwell on that. As it's navigation, so you may have heard that there's been a few incidents in Tasman Bay of recreational vessels getting tangled in muscle lines. So there's been three or four in the last few months. Uh, I'll say that both parties are partially at fault there. Some of those boats were doing 20 knots inside the cardinal marks where they should have been doing five. Um, but the industry also needs to improve the, the practice or the way that some of those lines are being sunk. So I'm just flagging with you here that since those incidents, the MFA has developed a standard operating procedure, 
which will tidy up the way that we that we sync all of the lines and also the way that we monitor and record which lines have been sunk, which will help council in its compliance efforts as well. Port Tarakaui, we can do an entire session on this, but we won't. Um, <laughs> I'd just like to thank TDC for progressing the phase one works and also assigning some reserves funding, so that's excellent. I'll also acknowledge the complexity of Port Tarakaui having been involved in the, uh, the steering group for the PGF application and also helping Robin Karen out in her work recently. But I will also just flag that there is some work to do you know, between TDC and NMFA and the industry about communicating uh, why the fees are what they are and talking about level of service requirements. Because if, if you take a step back and look at it from the industry perspective, we're being charged twice as much as we are in other parts, other locations around the country for a, a lesser level of service. Last slide. So Mediterranean fan room. Unfortunately, there's been another discovery in, in Port Tarakaui recently. So this is on a, a recreational vessel that is on one of the swing moorings in the outer arms of Port Tarakaui. And that vessel recently oh, spent yeah. some time in Auckland where fan worm is prolific and has returned to the top of the south and has quite heavily been cultivating fan worm on its, its hull and its keel. Now, that shot there is from the Coromandel in the Haraki Gulf. And that's something that the industry does not want to see. So fan worm, it competes with the mussels for food. It tangles up, it smothers all of your, uh, all of your growing rope, tangles up in your gear, makes processing difficult, it reduces productivity, something we want to avoid. So basically the message is all power to council and its functions as, as a biosecurity controller. And I hope that we can eradicate that one as we have with previous incursions. That's all. Hey, thanks, Ned. Very informative. Uh, a lot of information there. Um, I, I don't think we, we have, don't really have time to go around any rounds of questions. We, we've um, got our meeting to carry on with. But I think if you've got something specific or particular to check in with Ned about it, you can email him fairly easily. Yep. But uh, very helpful to have that overview and, um, and to have some of your concerns highlighted, but also the things that are progressing pretty well. Uh, so I appreciate you uh, both coming in. Thank you. Uh, I must say, Gary, your presentation was one of the slicker ones we've had here. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Okay. Yeah. I'm pretty committed to it. <laughs>
uh, the plan is that council will pay 40% of that. Um, in a, in a uh, nervous moment during the budget reading, there was some commentary about the Jobs for Nature funding. Of course, this council has received something in the order of 15 million from the various funding pots. We still have at least two years to go on some of those projects. Uh, as of yesterday, it looks like all of our funding is secured and including that includes some staff that are funded 100% out of that. So that's really uh, nice. We will see the completion of our projects. Um, and, and I would like to just remind people that it is still incredibly dry out there. We are still, as of this week, uh, Mutri Deep Eastern Aquifer is still on 30% rationing cut. If it wasn't for the dam at the moment, we would be seeing a, a, a different situation. The grass that you're seeing growing on Waimea Plains, the irrigated grass, we're still below the rooting point for um, pasture on the plains, so it's very dry at the moment. Um, and the last thing is that just a, a heads up from an internal thing that's happening at the moment around some of the data. So you, you saw Neil talking about data. There's so much data held by council and at the moment, we're just starting our data and insights program where we're working with Datacom to really uh, get our data to a, to, so it's in a trusted, safe and accessible place. And then we'll really start to see some of this information fly. There is a huge amount of data held by council and a lot of the infrastructure in the aquaculture space, which will become available in time out of those programs. So that's a really good positive, which the council has been really supportive of through the DIP program. All right, thank you. So uh, that's me, and we'll take the reporter's read, please. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for those extras. Um, Councillor Mayling, and Councillor McKenzie, and Councillor Butler. Just in relation to the fan worm, and, and I see the Harbour Masters here. So are you still running that program where you're doing whole checks over the summer? Or I spent a day out with the previous Harbour Master um, and, and with that contract because I found that invaluable because there were so many um, yachts and sailboats from other parts of the country that were in our waters over the summer in particular. Uh, yeah, so the um, Life Security team actually still run that initiative. Um, I was out there one day this summer, but they're now using a contractor that comes with his own vessel. Um, so uh, I don't... Uh, they do inform me when they're doing it, um, and I'm probably going to look at trying to get some sort of uh, signage or a flag for them to fly because uh, I had several phone calls from yachties going that someone coming around checking my boat and it's not the hubmaster. So um, I'll, I'll be doing some sort of awareness around that it's not necessarily going to be me doing the checking. But um, yeah, that's still happening. It was one of those checks in Tarakawi that's found this yacht. So, yeah. Thank you, uh, Councillor McKenzie. Thank you very much, through you, Chair. Um, are we doing the whole report? Uh, yes, I think that's okay because we've got our fantastic team here. Yeah, excellent. All right. Um, so I, I note on page six that um, councillor guidance is sought on whether we do our own submission um, to the primary production select committee. Um, if you're asking, uh, you know, I think probably I could be convinced just to go with um, Te Ura Kahika um, on that point. Um, I wanted to check um, with regards to the changes to the earthquake building standards. Um, talks in the report that we would get until 2037 with a two-year extension with regards to this building. So my question is, uh, are is that consistent with where we've landed in the long-term plan in terms of budget provision? Who are we going to here? Short straws? <laughs> <laughs> At this point in time, until we get confirmation of any extension on the on the on this building, at the moment it's in June 2033. So at this point in time, the LTP is absolutely correct. We have not had any confirmation from um, the BCA saying that it's another four years. We have indication that it might be coming through, and Matt can, can correct that, but um, um, business and Ministry of Business and in, in, Innovation and Employment have not actually come out and confirmed that yet. It's only been an indication. So until we get that confirmation, 
the LTP is still correct. All right, thank you for that. Um, just a couple more, if I may, um, Chair. So um, just in terms of the cases that are currently um, before the courts, um, I note in the commentary around um, discharge of contaminants from a rural industrial activity in Brightwater, and, and then it goes on to talk about there have been systemic problems. So I just want to understand, by using the phrase systemic problems, are we talking about systemic difficult problems with how you manage leach chase and whatever it is, and stormwater, or are we talking about problems with that company and how they're managing it? I mean, you know, I, I guess it's incredibly disappointing to get to this point um, in terms of it being before the courts. So what, what is the nature of systemic problems? So they are the actual, it's the management and the systems which are, being used on site to manage stormwater and leachate that's running from the processes which are occurring out there. So there's a set of systems which are in place, which involve um, treating leachate, capturing stormwater, and then a, a treatment train, which involves a wetland, um, a drain, and a settling pond. So that's the system, but the system's failing. There's too much water, um, and and so the system can't cope with the amount of contaminants and the amount of contaminated water, which is making the management of of, of the water uh, problematic because it's to be recycled on site. Um, and that's resulting in discharges from the pond when when we get, you know, uh, heavy rain events. That that's that's the nature of the problems, and that's what that's what needs to be uh, worked through, and and that system needs to be amended. And so, is it currently still well, obviously. I don't know whether the water is a, as a result of rain or the industry processing, but um, is it currently still happening, you know, or or do we need to do abatement notices? or? So they, an abatement notice was issued probably a year ago, um, and, and now it's, there's a prosecution. So those involved are being prosecuted before the court, and we will be seeking enforcement orders. Um, once that matter's finalised, which is in the next few weeks, those orders will require certain things to happen on site um, to uh, to address all our concerns. I can say that there, of recent times, a consultancy has been engaged by the landowner, and they have implemented some methodologies in recent weeks, which hopefully will mitigate some of those risks now. Right, thank you. And then my last one, Chair, if I may, just, um, you know, it's interesting to see the number of uh, resource consent applications for uh, subdivisions, um, mm -hmm. most of which where it's indicated in here are not consistent with the FDS. I guess... I don't know. I mean, it's a curious situation, isn't it, that we we do an FDS to outline kind of future development for the district, and so then hypothetically we end up in a situation where we have all of this development occurring if if they proceed inconsistent with the FDS, inconsistent with our infrastructure plans. Um, what a interesting system we work within, isn't it? Yes. Uh, are you willing to hear anything from anybody about this? <laughs> I did I did I did finish that with a slight tilt of my voice to I indicate noticed. there was a question mark at the it end. It almost sounded subtle too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I mean I mean I'm you know I, I suppose one of my questions around is how come? How come we've got this quite a lot of coming at once? Is it have we got is it uh purely coincidental? Uh it, 
Yeah. Are we making anything of it? Um, Other than it's a lot of work? We're just making some assumptions. It could be a little bit related to the development contributions policy coming into effect 1st of July. So if you get your application in and we do an ADA check for completeness and we say, yep, the tick's good to go to start processing, um, they sit in this financial year's DC. They lodge it after the 1st of July. They sit in the new DC numbers. So yeah. that could be a bit of... That's just us suspiciously. We've had a few something. surveyors say that they're looking at doing that, so we've had some... Yeah. Uh, yeah. And would they'd be looking at some fairly big numbers for their DCs with some of yeah. those lot sizes, yeah, eh? Ages. Lot numbers. Yeah, yeah. Have you anything to add? Nothing more to add. Then, yeah, she's very correct around the FDS. The FDS does um, a number of these uh, subdivisions. As, as I've outlined throughout there, though, the, um, the FDS was for a lot larger numbers of subdivisions and lot, lots in that area, and they've substantially submitted lower but that doesn't mean there's an incremental creep over the years if this is a staged way of looking at it so it's something we've got to be mindful as a council with um, these communities being set up and supporting facilities and communities at a wider plan planning of the area really yeah and rural three land noticing that featuring exactly. um, yep thank you uh councillor butler then councillor walking and uh deputy mayor brian Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I've just got a couple of things. Firstly, um, just to go back to the fan worm. Um, yeah, so we don't have a haul out facility at Port Tarakaui, and uh, it, it's quite expensive. But do you think that, in, given this, the appearance of this, that this um, could be, you know, a reason that we need to be a bit more? Um, are proactive about trying to get a fall out a haul out facility just for you know for biosecurity safety or do you think it's a kind of a, an aberrant appearance so i think um haul outs for um large scale fouling like this isn't actually recommended um because you the minute you disturb um the organism it spawns creating much more problems. Um, they do haul out by security risks in Nelson, and we have um, directed vessels to go there to haul out. But um, something of, of the scale of what we saw on the picture there and of what the vessel was like in Terracoe, it, it was cheaper um, and much, much safer to wrap it where it was. Uh, the reason um, it only cost uh, this, this person, I think it was, it was between four and five grand um, for the job there, was that the commercial divers that were doing the survey work were capable of doing the wrapping themselves, I mean, it's a local contractor out of Nelson. Um, had they not been able to do it, and we would be using the TDC's fab dock, which is a portable um, dock that you basically inflate and put the boat in and then um, chlorinate a thin layer of water around the hull. Um, and we, did, we do training with that with um, um, TDC staff, um, NNC staff, Marlborough City Council staff, and I think MPI are part of that as well. Um, yeah, um, Rob's nodding. Um, so we did training with that, and we did training um, last week, actually, um, in Jubilee Park. I've got some pictures I can include in my next report for you if you'd like to see them. Um, but, yeah, so we've got this portable dock, and um, we could deploy that um, pretty much remotely. Um, it would cost uh, quite a lot, but the charges are recoupable from the owner. Um, it would probably cost double for us to deploy the fab dock um, in staff time than um, charges from the commercial diving company that did the work for us this time. Um, so it is a, it is a, a significant yeah. amount of time, um, depending on what the biosecurity has it is. Um, fan worms pretty quick to die. I think um, only needs 10 hours, I think, in the in the dry dock um, or in the in the, um, the way they wrap them. Um, but some other things might need 10 to 12 days of constant monitoring. So, yeah, the cost shoots up if you have to do things like that. Um, but we are, you know, we are, um, we are ready for this, and they are the biosecurity team are very good at responding and checking. Um, yeah, any phone calls I've had to them this year revolving the ops that I've had concerned about, there's been a, a, a TDC staff on the vessel within um, a few hours and um, coming out with me to check the boat. So yeah, yeah, we're well, well aware of it. That's um, that's reassuring that we are actually, um, you know. We have got best practice, so that's really, you know, and the community will be reassured by that. 
I just wanted to have a second question about the applications for the subdivisions. And, um, you know, we, in terms of the types of houses that the subdivisions would actually provide, you know, we get a lot of, there's a lot of concern about people wanting small houses, smaller houses. And do you think that all these subdivisions, if they go ahead, are they all going to be three and four bedroom houses on big sections? Is there any way that, um, you know, that there can be some kind of incentive or encouragement to for a mix of houses in these subdivisions? Or do we have no no levers at all? Generally, no levers um, at the end of the day. Um, the lot sizes were made dictated a little bit of that because there is a mixture of clustering of some smaller ones. Um, for example, the residential sites, but at the end of the day, we do see that basically you'll develop or want to get as much, and our owner wants to get as much for the bang for their buck as far as larger houses on small sections as far as, yeah. So we're not seeing that. So unless we're going to put some incentive or some sort of ruling, rules around that that are pretty clear, which we haven't got. Um, yeah. And maybe at some point the market will just mm. determine that, hey, if that's people that's stop buying bigger it. homes and actually all oh, it's smaller homes that people want. Yeah. Anything further, Councillor? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Walker, then Deputy Mayor Bryan. Thank you, through you, Chair. Uh, this is for you, Al Harbour Master. Um, so the storm impact on navigation. So the, the report, page 7, 4.21, talks about an April storm event. I must have been sleeping at the time. Um, I didn't think that that event was huge, but it did displace those markers and um, seven of them. So is that a regular or um, just, yeah, I was really surprised to read that that event actually had created that much damage. That's my first question. And do we have assurance that they're going to sit still now that, that you've done the work on the chains. And my second one, if I can, then you can answer them both hopefully, is around the um, oil pollution levy funding. What impact is that going to have with losing that funding? And uh, so what financial impact will it have? And do we know the impact on our environment if we can't respond? Thanks. Um, so the storm damage, um, it, it wasn't a severe storm. The issue was that it coincided with a, a, a big high tide, so a spring tide. Um, and any uh, residents of Motawake will know that it did go straight over the, uh, the, the the sandbar in front of Motawake there in a lot of places that it hasn't traditionally gone over. Um, in terms of the assurances that it can't happen again, it can 100% happen again. Um, we haven't upgraded the weight of the chain all the way yet. Um, so, uh, working within budget constraints to, to make that happen, but it will happen before um, the springtime storms. Um, I'm, I'm going to yeah put my, put my money on that one. Then I'll make sure it is it is upgraded, it's particularly on those outer uh, floats that get exposed to to more severe weather. Uh, there's also currently a safer boating um, grant application in um, to support um, the replacement of all of the chain for all of the markers, not just the seven that get the most exposed. Um, typically, it's not been a massive problem to the harbour master um, or to the, to the council, um, predominantly because when it is that rough, people aren't going out. So the mark, the fact the markers aren't in place hasn't been a big deal. Um, however, when I did bring it up with um, the previous harbour master, he he, uh, he said that there has been one fishing boat, commercial fishing boat, run straight up on the beach on Kena because he followed the lights that uh, were on the beach. Um, so it is a big concern to us, and I'm, I'm really not keen to see it happen again. So we'll be working hard on that one. Um, as for the pollution uh, levy, the only part of the funding there they're stopping is the staff time allotment to training. Um, so they're still paying for all the training. They're still paying to fly staff up to Auckland and receive the training. Uh, they're still paying for all of the spill gear, the response. Um, it, the minute there's any oil hitting the water, they're, they're they will pick up the tab or the operator will. Um, the, the one cost to council is staff time. Um, I've never heard of any other training scheme 
in the world really that pays for staff time to be trained on a, on a resource um, that is predominantly for council benefit. Um, so I think we've been incredibly lucky to get that paid for for, for this long. Um, there are questions being asked as to whether it will nationally deplete the level of service, as in whether councils will still invest the number of staff needed. Um, so this is being asked um, a lot around the table at the moment. Um, from our point of view, I don't think it's going to diminish what we can do. Um, it's possibly something we've got to be a bit wiser on making sure we make the most of the time we have um, to train um, and um, make sure we get some really appropriate training um, regime in place. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's slightly um, annoying the timing that they brought this announcement out because had it been before um, LTP, we might have been able to allocate more time within budgets for people to do this. Um, so it's probably more a, a timing issue um, than, um, than anything else. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for you, two questions of two topics, if I may, a number of questions just relating to them. Firstly, uh, freshwater farm plans on page six at 3.7, it talks about engagement on free streams of work. Um, Rob, I guess you're going to be answering it. <laughs> um, when it talks about um, engagement, I'm just wondering how wide is that engagement? Does that get down to uh, farmers or producer groups or anything like that, or is that just the regional sector? And particularly at 3.73 around the certification and audit process. Uh, through the chair, at the moment, this is still at the very high level. So this is still uh, uh, so local government talking to government and the higher level. Right. But at a staff level, we are very engaged with our community. So we're still working away on what we will do to make sure it fits. Excellent. Thank you. Any idea on the timelines for that? And it still hasn't changed from where it was previously into 2025. As far as, I'm, as far as I'm aware, it's the same timeline. Thank you. And then just turning to resource consent, if I may, Katrina, just in the report you talked about needing another planner or maybe two, um, is that goal being achieved yet? And secondly, is that going to affect the timeliness of processing these um, applications? Yeah, correct. That's, that's always the um, risk. Um, we have since provided... Uh, done this report, um, had, uh, you may know Jenna Walter, who's a senior planner, who's come back from maternity leave. So she is taking on um, one of those, um, which is actually, that can put it on hold at the moment, um, working through some cultural matters anyway. So we've got a little bit of time up our sleeve with that one. Um, the other one, I um, don't think Jenna's taken that on as well. Yes, yes, she has. <laughs> trying to confirm what was happening in the last week or so. Um, so, yeah, Jenna has taken on both of those two that I said I had known for this part. She's well experienced. Yeah, she is, and she did the pre-app as well for one of those, which right. is... Yeah, yeah, it's a bit of a mystery why all of those are covered, although not yeah. totally. Yeah. Yeah, but they all want to get their applications in. It'll just yeah. be interesting to see how quickly they really want them. Yeah, it just, it just pushes our resources when you're quite thin on the ground as it is, seeing yeah. a wise and experienced to suddenly... Pull this up and get people on the ground running. And now, just uh, for the benefit of the wider public and myself, you just sent us a link last week about the um, email we used to get around the um, applications and decisions and referred us to a public one. Is that just purely a list? Because I've had a look at it a couple of times. You can't click on the link and get any more further information from that. No, it's solely a list. There's no extra um, searchable functionality to it. Um, it's just to get it there. So because of the Magic Cloud update, we had no alternative option to push emails out as notifications. So we had to quickly find a way to manage still getting this information out to iwi groups, uh, NCTA, Waka Kotahi, the councillors, um, Fish and Game, et cetera that have been getting this, these lists of applications and decisions for quite some years. I think we've been doing this for over 13 years or something, which is great to be supplying this information as much as we can. But, um, yeah, solely a list. So if someone wants to track their consent or... Um, they can still do that. ...details, how do they do that? Yeah, so we've still got track your resource consent on our website, which I'm not too sure if how many people are actually <laughs> familiar with it. But there is actually, if you search in the tool in the search bar on the website, track your resource consent, it'll come up and you put your number in or address and then it'll 
bring it up how many days it is and some comments where it's at. Okay, um, so thank that, you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Kinnamoth. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, question for the flight deck, actually. We normally have a screen up there that says the people who are offline. Online, sorry. Um, I've got several. Um, we are, um, if you can frame them very succinctly, so often we have quite a little story into our, we all do it into our questions, but it's very succinct framed questions, except Councillor Alice, clearly. Uh, but also we'll need, some, we'll need some succinct answers as well. So we've got eight minutes left and we've got another item to address. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, clause, sorry, page six, clause 3.3, .3, Councillor guidance required. Councillor McKenzie uh, made uh, a statement there that um, she'd be quite happy for the uh, Te Uru Kahika um, provide the response. I would in this instance as well, but also suggest that in other instances, the staff also have a right to um, do submissions. So I wouldn't give carte blanche um, guidance to the Te Uru Kahika to do all submissions on our behalf? Yeah, th th this is just where the council puts his own submission in, yes. not so much staff, but council submission goes in or we go with the body. Uh, and I'll put that question to everybody uh, as we're finishing. Next, uh, I have please. a couple of questions for the Harbour Master. Um, the Sentinel is getting a refit, and it seems to be a substantial refit. Um, is this the normal for a boat in this age in hours, or is it um, has it had a hard life? Uh, it's really short answer. Yes to both of those things. It's had a hard life, and it is normal. Um, typically, vessels require ten percent of the original purchase price per year to be spent on maintenance. And if you don't spend that each year, you'll have to spend it in the long run. And so we're well within those confines at the moment. Um, and I'm trying to do this as efficiently as possible. And one last question: um, Are you intending to take your role out to the schools, the maritime industry, the boat clubs and start doing a promotional tour on water safety, your role, introducing yourself, that sort of thing. Um, I think that's what the previous Chart Master did a little bit of. So I'm uh, already heavily involved with the, the Maritime School in, over in Nelson. I'm still an examining tutor for them as well um, as this role. So I do go over there probably every month, um, to be honest, and talk, talk to students that are coming through. They're going to be hopefully skippers in our region. Um, I've been to several of the boat clubs um, in Monowaco already. Um, and I have been over to Golden Bay a couple of times as well. Um, as the navigation safety bylaw um, engagement process picks up, um, I'll be doing a lot of it through that as well. In terms of schools, uh, we are enrolled to the um, Clued Up Kids program, um, which I think is at Saxon Fields this year. Um, so we'll be doing that. I think last year we had over 2,000 kids um, come through that program. Um, so we're, we're signed up for that already. And um, when summer comes around, we'll kick off um, a more of a summertime campaign as well. Thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, I imagine the boat gets a fair crack of use compared to many vessels. Um, in terms of uh, whether we put a council submission in or we go with uh, Te Uru Kahika, the body's submission, uh, we just, uh, excuse me, hi. Um, is this something we're going to finish in about three minutes? Is this something that could be resolved then or needs to happen now? Lovely, thank you. Um, maybe a show of hands if you're happy for the for council not to put its own submission in, but to go with uh, Te Uru Kahika. Well, that's enough, I think. Thank you. So that's our guidance there that's been specifically asked for. 
And just to acknowledge the incident on the 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 um, the mussel farm, that was a very very serious incident, hey. Eh? And um, we can think, well, you know, they were going 25k and they should be going five. It still would have been a fair crack to them, I think, if they'd also come to a sudden halt. But um, yeah, is there any is there anything that council might have or could have addressed? Do we know the sort of the state of the sunk lines business? Um, what have we taken away from that incident? It's a very very serious incident, and I think certainly very seriously harmed. Um, so in conjunction with the Harbour Master, uh, the Council's compliance team have been involved and, and are investigating breaches of the RMA in terms of the conditions of consent or um, probably one, it appears that probably one of the farms is, is the culprit. Uh, it appears... I mean, it's early days, but it appears that the weights that were applied to some of these lines were insufficient. And over time, they've uh, popped up. So in conjunction with the Harbour Master and an industry, um, industry itself has uh, been out there monitoring. We've been out there overseeing that monitoring. Um, I think about 40 to 50 lines have been lifted and reset with um, best practice guidelines weight. Um, so we, we're fairly confident now that things are things are in place. In terms of outcome, that will be decided at the end of the investigation. Yes, I was thinking about whether there's any 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 of our monitoring things that we do, or that you know where something's been missed here. In terms of our side of things, I guess I'm wanting to um, know that we've uh, whether we've uh, if there's anything that we could have or should have attended to. So from a um, navigation safety point of view, um, like you say, they were speeding within a reserve yeah. area. And so that's a, an education um, issue that I will look at addressing um, throughout the sort of summer education campaign. Um, and I'll contact um, MFA um, around talking to them about supporting that education right. program, um, certainly throughout the process of this Um They've they've requested um, you know working together for an education scheme, so um, I'll, I'll look to that. Um, and I've also um, got a incident reporting tool on our website now, and I'll be starting some sort of education around if you have an incident on the water, please report it. Because if we'd had more notice on some of these incidences, yeah. um, a lot of them didn't come to light until after the last one, which was okay. obviously more serious. Um, we might have been out of act quicker as well. Okay, but if we don't know, it's hard to do. I'd like a mover for the uh, for the report that we received the um, group manager's report, uh, Councillor Kinnamont's, uh, seconded by Councillor McKenzie. Um, I'll put that resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Uh, against, carried. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, we're going to move to the uh, the last item, which is the referral policy on dangerous dams, earthquake prone dams, and flood. Brown dams. Uh, Councillor Mayling's happy to move. Uh, Councillor McKenzie. Happy to second. Great, thank, thank you. you. Are there any questions or comments or Councillor Kinnamont. I'll keep it very short. Thank you. Dugan's Dam, Dock One. Are we following up on Dock or are they just going to? Uh, so, with regards to that, we are unsure of the heritage status of that. And under the policy, there's um, specific provisions where a heritage dam also becomes a dangerous dam. Um, we've directly contacted the Takuka office and they're aware of the policy and their obligations um, yeah, as the landowner. Thank you. Uh, thanks to those that were involved in the panel for this work. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. An additional... 
point three on the resolution. Okay, I'll put the resolution. Like all those in favour, please say aye. Uh, against, carried. Thank you. Uh, which brings us to a close of the meeting. Thank you for your contributions, and particularly to staff that have contributed to a, a wide range of matters in the reports. Um, thanks, Amy. Um, and thank you, Elaine. Uh, I'll close with a cut of care. Uh, kia hiki te kōrero, kia waitia, kia mama te manawa o te tangata, a kia u ke te ara mō tātou, e ora nei, uh, ko rongo, ki runga, uh, kia tina, hui e, uh, kia ora everybody, thank you.